Ephesians is one of Paul's general letters to the church. It's called an encyclical, which means even though as we read it, it's to the, a letter to the church in Ephesus, it really was a letter that was sent to a whole bunch of churches in that region. And so it would go to one church, and then it would be passed on to another and read there and passed on to another. So it's kind of one of those letters that contain not specific words to a specific church, but kind of Paul's general teaching to all of the Christians in that region. So we're going to be reading from Ephesians chapter 5, verses 15 through 20. Be careful then how you live, not as unwise people, but as wise, making the most of the time because the days are evil. So do not be foolish, but understand what the will of the Lord is. Do not get drunk with wine, for that is debauchery, but be filled with the Spirit as you sing psalms and hymns and spiritual songs among yourselves, singing and making melody to the Lord in your hearts, giving thanks to God the Father at all times and for, excuse me, and for everything in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. A word of God that is still speaking. Thanks, thanks be to God. As I was working on my sermon this week, it's like, where do you go with wisdom? I mean, you could go take it so many different directions. And I realized as I was reading over and over these words from Paul that what Paul was doing was passing on his wisdom principles to the people in the churches, to people who were just in those early stages of figuring out what does it mean to follow Jesus Christ? What does it look like to give my life to Christ? And he was sharing his guidance, his principles that he has found in his own life to be important for that. So here's my question to you. If you were to write down the most important pearls of wisdom you've learned in life to pass on to your grandchildren, what would that wisdom be? If you were to pass on the most important lessons you've learned about following Christ, what would you teach? Both of our scriptures today do speak about wisdom. Solomon prays for it as he feels that responsibility of leading God's people, realizing he can't do it alone. That might be the biggest lesson that Solomon passes on. You don't have to do it alone. God is there. Just ask. Paul, as I've already said, writes about wisdom as he exhorts his believers to be careful about how they live, to, be, to live, wise, live as wise and not foolish people, because they are a new creation in Christ. So, as we read through all of his letters, set aside the old you and embrace this new life in Christ. And all of his letters basically flesh out that. What does it look like? How do you live as people grounded in Christ. And so, back to that question, if you were going to share your wisdom about what it means to be grounded in Christ and to live that life, what would you share? I'm going to share with you seven principles, or uh, wisdom principles, I guess I'll call it, that I have learned over the years. None of them should surprise you. They are all grounded in our faith. But as I share my list, I want you to be thinking about what's on your list. What wisdom do you live by that you want to pass on to the next generation of believers? Wisdom principle number one, happiness is found in giving, not getting. Most TV ads tell us happiness is found in getting all of this stuff. It comes from what you own. It comes from what you can buy and how much you can get. Now, if they are right, the best use of our time and energy is to be spent getting it, whatever it may be, and then you have to protect it, and you have to keep it, and whatever it is is always at risk. Giving is just the opposite. If I'm looking for opportunities to give, I'm not spending all of my time and energy worried about protecting what I already have or getting more. Now, I will admit I do want more. 
but I don't want it so I could keep it. Linda and I actually have this conversation quite frequently. We wish we had more so we could give more away. I want more so I could do more with it. I want more so I could make more of a difference in this world. I don't know of anyone who is truly happy only thinking about themselves. I don't know of anyone who's truly happy who's just so focused on getting more and more and more. When I turn inward, I feel empty no matter how much I have. It's not until I start focusing my life outward and living a generous life that I come alive. Jesus tried to teach that to his disciples. He modeled it in his own life. He shows us that what is most precious can only be had when you give it away. Principle number two, what matters today isn't what we did yesterday, but what we will do tomorrow. So every year this church conducts, and this church could be any church, this church conducts its annual commitment drive to raise funds for next year's budget. In this particular church, the richest man in the congregation every year stands up and tells his story about how he credits his success today to a day when he was a little boy in church and he put one dollar, which was all the money he had in the offering plate. Every year he'd tell that story. And one year, someone finally got tired of hearing the same story over and over because a voice came from the back of the congregation and yelled out, I dare you to do it again. How many of us would put everything we have in that plate? Let's talk about Moses. Moses had an interesting life, born to a Hebrew slave, adopted by the daughter of Pharaoh. He kills a man, and he runs away to the desert, becomes a sheep herder. And then one day, God speaks to him out of a, a fire in a bush, and he tells him, go back to Egypt and free God's people. Now, if Moses had just chalked that up to a desert hallucination, we would not know who Moses was. We only know Moses because of what he did next. He went back to Egypt, he challenged Pharaoh, he led the people of God through the wilderness to a new beginning. It does not matter who we were. It does not matter what we have done, no matter how great it is. What matters most is what we will do next. Now, that's really good news because it means our past does not have to haunt us. Maybe we didn't always make the best decisions. Maybe we wish we could take back something we said or did. Well, of course, we can't turn back time. We cannot undo what we've done, but we can move forward. And our God is a God of second chances. God does not care what we've done. God cares about what we will do next. And that chapter has not been written yet. Principle number three, we all fall short, so stop beating yourself up over it and stop beating others up over it too. Paul said to the Roman church, all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. That phrase, the glory of God, has to do with living in ways that honor God and others. So basically, he was saying, we all blow it, get over it, none of us are holy, perfect, none of us can look back at everything we've done and said, there is nothing here that should ever be changed, it is, it is perfect as it is. None of us can do that. Of course, that doesn't stop us from sometimes thinking we are more perfect than the person next to us and looking down on them, and it doesn't necessarily stop us from beating ourselves up for not being as good as we think we should be. Either way is a very sad way to live. If we can't accept with compassion the imperfection and flaws in ourselves and in those around us, then we have no basis for relationships. What hope do we ever have of a meaningful and good relationship with anyone if we're always focused on the flaws. All of us have fallen short. Get over it. 
let's treat each other and ourselves with compassion. Paul reminds us that while we all sin, for those who believe we are set right or justified by grace, and this is a gift God gives us, doesn't mean we're never going to blow it again. We will. It does mean in God's eyes we are beautiful and we are forgiven. What if we could see others as God sees us? Sinners who've fallen short, but forgiven and beautiful. Then there's no judgment. And there's space for good and healthy relationships to grow. Wisdom principle number four really kind of is just a slight extension of that. Love others, warts and all. If we can't love others with their warts, why would we expect them to love us with ours? And what an incredible gift it is to know you are loved in spite of all of your warts and all of your flaws and all of the ways you fall short. When we are loved with that kind of a love, then we know we found a safe place. And we all need a safe place. Sometimes we need it to heal. Sometimes we need it to grow. But that safe place only happens when we are willing to love ourselves and others, warts and all. Wisdom principle number five. This is a glass half full or half empty. Let's say your spouse has a job that has them traveling all over the country. They're gone quite a bit, so you don't get to see each other a lot. And you have the more flexible job, so you're staying home and, and you're taking care of the kids. You have a choice. You can be resentful that your spouse is off traveling while you are taking up the bulk of the child care duties there. Or you can take joy in knowing that your spouse is doing something that gives them joy and that doing the work God has called them to do, and you get to spend some of the most important time you will ever have with your children. Everything has an upside and a downside. You can choose to be either happy or miserable. The danger of focusing on the downside is that you'll never notice the blessing God has for you on the upside. Wisdom principle number six. Do you know what the number one root cause of divorce is in the United States? It's not infidelity. It's not money. Good guess, though. Money comes in second. But it would not be an issue if it weren't for the first. Nobody has a guess. Audience participation. I'm sorry, what? I'm sorry. Greed? No, no. Communication. Yes, gold star to Marlene. Yeah, it's communication. Often there are money problems because couples are not communicating about what's going on and how they're feeling and things. So it really is communication. Whenever I counsel a couple as we're getting ready uh, for their their marriage service, uh, that's one of the things I talk about is that. If you do nothing else, learn how to communicate well with each other. Because poor communication causes more problems than it solves. So, my sixth principle really is, I guess, less faith-based, but very practical. Learn how to communicate honestly and openly with others. A sharing of feelings and frustrations, joys and ideas a willingness to actively listen without judgment allows us to be there for each other and to understand each other better. And that creates a safe place. And what happens in safe places? We can heal, we can grow, we can become the person God invites us to be. It allows us also to celebrate one of the greatest gifts God gives us, which is that other person right in front of us because we'll really get to know them and hopefully they will really get to know us as well. So if you want to enjoy the greatest gift God has to give you in that sense, you've got to learn to communicate. So that's one of the, the big principles I would share. But the last one and probably the most important one, let God show you the way. When Jesus called his disciples, he didn't say, you lead, I'll come along later. 
He said, follow me. We are invited on a journey that's going to take us places we never would have imagined. God has plans and purposes for this world that we can't even guess, and God invites us to be a part of them, and we'll only discover what they are by following, which can be scary because we don't always know where we're going, and we don't always know what's around the next bend. We may know the next three steps, but we may not know the fourth step and what awaits us there. So, trust that if you follow, Jesus will lead you to a place that is life-giving. Trust that if you follow, even when it's difficult, Jesus will be at your side. Trust that if you follow, you will be doing God's work. You will be Christ in the world wherever you are. And I always add this, trust that if you follow and you somehow take a wrong turn and don't realize it, Jesus is going to come catch up with you and start leading you again from there. So how do we follow? Pray. Listen for what God is speaking to you in the silence and listen to what God is speaking to you in your experiences in the world. Focus on the greater good when things get difficult. Look to the future because as we've already said, what's important isn't what you did yesterday, it's what you will do tomorrow. Remember that your life belongs to God. You've been called for a purpose. And so when you go to follow, Jesus is going to lead you to a place where you can fulfill that purpose. Trust that. Jesus led his disciples to places they never thought they'd go. They touched people they never thought they would ever meet. They made a difference in the lives of others by living generous, eye, generous lives and by seeing each other with God's eyes. Because they did that, because they followed, that's why we are here today. So where will Christ lead you? Where will Christ lead us? Where will Christ lead this church? I don't have all those answers. I do know that if you take one step and then the next and the next, we will all eventually get where God is leading us. It can be scary because we don't always know where Christ will take us. But we can know if we follow, if we live those principles I just shared, then God will do amazing things through us. But perhaps more personally, we'll know that we are doing something that matters. So those are the wisdom principles that I want to pass on to others. They aren't always easy to live, but with God's help, those principles can change your life. And by keeping them as your focus, your life as a whole will not only be more focused, you will be a blessing to those around you. And you will start a ripple effect that will extend far beyond what you could ever imagine. So let me ask you again, what is the wisdom you would share that would help guide someone who wants to live a life grounded in Christ? What do you want to teach that next generation about what it means to belong to Christ? I invite you to make that list this week and then be very intentional about not just living it yourself, but teaching it to somebody else. Amen.